Evergreen. So good to see you again. I'm Mrs. Peeler and we're going to pick up where we left off on the Castle Diary, the Journal of Tobias Burgess. Okay, so we are on page 42 and we know a couple of things are happening. He's still kind of learning about the castle. Um, we know that the joust is coming up here in six weeks, so we'll see how quickly we arrive at the joust. He's not a very good archer and the cooks in the kitchen kind of like to make fun of poor Tobias. So let's get reading, okay? I'm on page 42. March 19th, Monday. Played at nights with Mark, Oliver, and Humphrey today. As Mark is bigger than me, he was the horse and I rode his back. We won. Oliver toppled from his horse and got a bloody nose. Serves him right, for he did twist my ears most painfully and call me the worst names when I first wore my new shirt. March 20th, Tuesday. I wore yesterday, I wrote yesterday by candles flicker and fell asleep with quill in hand. So instead of a pencil, they use a quill. When I awoke, the candle has set the pages alight and would have burned my straw mattress or worse if Humphrey had not smelled the smoke and beat out the flames. Oh, yikes. This morning, chaplain, chaplain likewise beat my backside to teach me to care with candles. To keep, to teach me care with candles, he said. Ate salt fish again today. Disgusting. Here they are. Here, they are more careful to follow the church's rule than at home. So besides every Tuesday, Friday, and Saturday being fish days, they also eat fish on each church festival. This means we eat vile fish more often than flesh or fowl. I don't think Tobias likes fish. April 11th, Wednesday. Watched my uncle practice for the joust today. He charged 11 times at a wooden ring, hung from a tree, and caught it on his lance five times. And the lance is that long stick that you see his uncle holding. So it's like it looks like a really big sword, but it's made out of wood. It takes much skill to lift the ring from its hook while galloping at full speed. And all who saw this agree it bodes well for the contest. April 22nd, the Lord's Day. Tomorrow begin the jousts. The host of noble knights who accepted my uncle's challenge are lodged at inns nearby or are encamped upon the fields outside the castle. So, or they're camping around the castle. Two score gaily colored tents sprouted in the night like mushrooms. Flying from the lance, or two score like 20. Flying from lances planted in the ground, the knight's pennants or flags look like flowers in, the, in a spring meadow. All the talk is of who shall prevail or who shall win. And methinks the men of the castle guard palace the castle guard place wagers on the wages wagers on the winner i pray my uncle shall vanquish or beat them all monday april 23rd this being the feast day of saint george the whole castle was astir well before sunrise in preparation for the jousts all the clashes were keenly fought but i shall give account of my uncle's combat first his opponent was Lord Sudbury. Everyone from the castle and the village folk beside gathered eagerly to watch their charge. After some, after some ceremony, of which I shall tell later, the two knights trotted to opposite ends of the lists, which is what they call the strip of field where the combat takes place. When they, when they were some 300 paces apart, they turned to face each other. The sunlight danced on their shiny helms or helmets and on the bright colors of their family's arms blouzened on their shields and armor. On the command, Lazi Ailer from a herald, both knights urged their horse, horses forward, pricked with sharp spurs. The snorting horses galloped faster and faster until they ran as swift as a march, eag a march gale. Each knight aimed his lance at the shield of the other, and the watchers cried, Huzzah! when my uncle stayed on his horse and knocked Sudbury to the ground. So the two uh, guys are on their horses, and they're coming at each other with the lances, and psh, they're trying to knock the other one off their horse. And Tobias's uncle won and knocked the other knight off of his horse. Um, three times my uncle toppled Sudbury. Oh, and you can see a great picture of the jousting that is happening with the horses and the lances. 
At their third meeting, though, the force of Sudbury's blow lifted my uncle, too, clean from his saddle. Those who watched gasped, alas, in fear for my uncle's life, but he quickly rose to his feet and raised his iron glove to still the hubbub. Then, though, he found that he could not rise the visor on his helm, so twisted it from so twisted it was from the fall. And when later the heralds announced that my uncle was the victor, he was nowhere to be found. So uncle might have gotten hurt a little bit. At length, a search of the castle discovered my uncle in the armory with his head laid on an anvil and the smith at work upon his helm. Tis surely a wonder the smith could remove it without harming a hair on my uncle's head. So it got stuck on his head. <laughs> April 25th, Wednesday. There seems each day of the jousts to be less sport than the day before and more boring ceremony. Before combat begins each morn, the knights withdraw to their arming tents where a squire helps them dress for the jousts because they have to get on all their, their armor and their knight stuff. When they return fully armed, there is much bowing low and making of speeches. When these dull preparations are complete, the heralds proclaim the names of the com combatants whose faces are hidden behind their shiny helms. Only then do the first two knights face each other and spur on their horses. And it, to my mind, the excitement that follows is over far too soon. April 25th, Thursday, 20, April 26th, Thursday. The jousting ends at last. I swear I should die of boredom if I were to listen to just one more speech. And after so many charges, all knights look the same. If I had known it would be thus, I should have feigned illness on Monday, and so escaped the ordeal. The new horse that I wear for this, the new hose that I wear for this grand event is hot, or the new clothes that I'm wearing are hot, for it clings to my legs as tightly as the, as the skin clings to a sausage. And it is my duty to wait upon my aunt all day while she watches, which tires me much. Gilbert, Earl of Hertford, was the day mortality, was this day's mor mortal, mortally, ugh, was this day mortally wounded in the jousts. Mortally wounded means he um, was wounded very, very, very badly. When I talked of it with Mark, he only said, well, tis common. So the Earl of Hertford might have, might have died. May 3rd, Thursday. Today was an e Egypt day, and as all know, ill fortune follows any work that starts on those two unlucky days. Um, on those two unlucky days in the month, our chaplain cautioned us that twas but a superstition for heathen Egypt. My uncle also told us we should not mind it. Later, though, I heard him tell a groom to put away the horse uh, he had saddled, for only fools start journeys on Egypty days. So it's like Friday the 13th. You know how some people think that Friday the 13th are unlucky? Egypty days, I guess, were thought to be unlucky. May 14th, Monday. While we studied this forenoon, my cousin Abigail scratched a message in her wax tablet and passed it to me. Chaplain seized it, and now I must rise before dawn for a week and pray with him. This seems the most unjust. I am punished, though I did nothing wrong. She did, she did wrong, yet is not punished. May 27th, the Lord's Day. Yesterday was one of great celebration, for my uncle dubbed Simon a knight. Now he is 21. Simon has been full seven years a squire and has learned well the noble skills of knighthood. Two days did Simon spend in prayer and fasting, and fasting means when you don't eat. On Friday night, he slept not at all, but kept vigil in the chapel, praying until dawn. Then at cock crow, or when the rooster crowed, he bathed and dressed in a tunic of pure white and attended mass. Only after this could he break his fast and venture out into the bailey for the armoring ceremony. First, my uncle dressed him in a coat of mail, or like, like a chain armor. Then Simon put on a gleaming helm or helmet and gilded spurs and grasped a shield painted with the two Burgess ravens. When this was done, he knelt to await the colleague the blow for my uncle's sword that would make him a knight. Oh, so that's what the coley is when you are now a knight. Mm, knighted, that's a coley. Neat. I thought this would be no more than a light tap and was alarmed
alarmed to see how heavy the, was the blow. But Simon was expecting it thus. He rose speedily and swore a solemn vow to be a gallant and brave knight. Then all cheered as he mounted a fine Spanish palfrey and rode around the bailey. Later, there was a feasting in the hall in Simon's honor. He will make a fine knight, and he is a good and kind cousin. June 9th, Saturday. The weather of late has been fierce and hot. We have not seen a cloud in weeks, and the ground is parched from want of rain. The river has sunk lower than any can remember, and green slime grows in the part of the moat where we usually swim. In the bailey, two men dig a new well. This is oft a wet and muddy task, but as there is little water to fill the well, the men can work dry foot. June 13th, Wednesday. The garden robes all reek. When I have need of them, I rush, nimbly clutching my, clutching my nose. I let fall my hose and pray that relief will be quick. This forenoon, when I sat upon the wooden seat, out from under it flew a black fly, so fat that at first I took it to be a wren. I think he's talking about the bathroom. Hmm. June 15th, Friday. This day, the gong farmer came from the village to work below the south wall. On this side of the castle, the garden robes empty down shoots into the moat. Oh, yeah, the gardener robes. Gardener robes are at the bathroom. So you can kind of see a picture of what going to the bathroom was like back in 1285. I'm so glad for indoor plumbing. Thank goodness. Anyway, so the person's here to clean it all out and it empties into the moat, gross. But because there has been no rain, ugh, the moat is sluggish in its flow and everything that falls from the chutes stays where it drops. Ugh. The gong farmer must clear not only the piles but, but others besides, for elsewhere in the castle the gardener robes empty into pits, which must be cleaned to keep them sweet. Ugh. Gross. One of the gardener robes shoots is blocked and the gong farmer must reach up inside this slimy pit to unclog it. I would not do his job's job for all of the king's gold. A humming black cloud hangs always above the gong farmer's head. Well, yeah, he's stinky. Nose warns of his approach long before eyes espy him and all ears are alert to the squeaking of his stinking cart. Ugh. Oh, be thankful for indoor plumbing friends. June 20th, Wednesday, woke two nights past the crashing of thunder. Now the rain does not stop and we are awash with water. Thank goodness the drought is over. July 9th, Monday. Today at the table, my aunt and uncle talk softly, mouth to ear. Isabel, my aunt's companion, has told me that a grand earl is coming to Stranbro. He and his household are journeying north and will rest at the castle for at least two nights. I, div I divined from their talk that my aunt and uncle are already planning a great banquet for his visit, even though till st tis still some weeks away. July 14th, Saturday. This morn, my aunt told Isabel the reason for my uncle's keen preparations. And she, and as she is friendly towards me, Isabel has entrusted me also with the secret. It seems this great Earl has the ear of the king and my uncle hopes to gain favor by welcoming him. Welcoming him. So that means um, the ear of the king is just, he's good friends with the king and you know, everyone wants the king to like them. So here we go. Though my uncle's castle is grand, this earl has an estate many times larger. As there are pebbles on a beach, so ha he has gold coins in equal numbers. So this guy's pretty rich. July 20th, Friday. Isabel tutored me in table manners this day, though I needed it not. If you eat with the earl's husband while they are here, she said, you uh, have a care to spit politely on the floor, not over the table. <laughs> so the table manners, if you're gonna spit, spit on the floor, don't spit on the table. Sounds fair. When I sniffed, she reminded me that I should wipe my nose. It is only seemly to clean my hands on my clothes before touching food. So <laughs> table manners weren't great back then. July 27th, Friday. 
Towards the end of lessons today, we heard music from beyond the castle walls. Abigail and I made haste to find out whence had come the sound or where the sound came from. And Simon told us that a band of players had passed by on their way to the village inn. They have come at my uncle's bidding for the banquet. These folk journey near and far, singing from their bread. And Simon has said he will take us to see them on the morrow, or the next day, July 28th, Saturday. We found the players outside the village church, amusing a crowd of folk. The tumblers were most marvelous, and though one showed me how he walks on his hands, I could not matter even one, master even one step. The minstrels sang of our king's victory in the West. Their verses brought me news, too, of wars and great happenings on their lands. Most songs were jolly, though, and the crowd that was gathered there knew them of old and joined in with the choruses. A few folk dropped a farthing, or like money, in a leathern hat, which the tumblers passed around. Others gave them bread or cheese or brought a jug of ale to pay for this fine entertainment. July 30th, Monday. Today, two great ox carts trundled across the drawbridge to the kitchen yard. It took cooks, servants, nearly half the day to unload and store all the provisions for the feast. The first cart bore barrels of wine and ale so large they had to be rolled for they could not be lifted. The second cart held all manners of meat and fish. One was most strange with the tail of a fish, but the fur of a beast and the face of a man with whiskers complete. Later, Cook told me what twas some kind of sea beast. Tis fantastical food we shall be eating when at last we sit down at our tre tre trenches, trenchers. On, we on Wednesday arrives the Earl, and on Thursday will be the banquet. August 7th, Tuesday. These past five days, the whole household supped in hall in honor of our most noble guest, the Earl of Branstone. But straight away after the feast, a fever afflicted me, and I was taken to lie in the great chamber where my aunt and Isabel could watch over me. Though somewhat recovered, I am still weak as a kitten and must stay in bed, so I shall use the time to write of past events, for I fear I neglect my journal. The feast itself was the grandest thing I have ever seen. I could not help but stare at the many fine clothes and the gold and silver dishes. It was the food, though, that caused all presents to gasp in a ma all presents to gasp in amazement and marvel at the seemingly endless array of dishes. Here were majestic peacocks stuffed and roasted and proudly dressed in their feathers, and there the tiny tongues of larks, and fish of all kinds in plenty, baked and boiled and platter after platter of roasted meats rich with sauces. Oh my gosh, and that next picture is just awesome of all the events that are happening during the feast. So cool. The Earl had come with a host of servants who helped us bring out the dishes for each course. Each dish was carried in with much ceremony and presented to my uncle and the Earl before it was served. When the dishes were laid on the tables, we sat down to eat. There were a great many dishes I did not recognize. One seemed half bird, half beast. Mark named it cockatree, tis called. Hmm, never heard of that. Uh, but I know not where it's hunted. This made Humphrey laugh so hard, he almost spat out his food. Mark, he snorted, tis but a kitchen trick. First they pluck a big fowl and cut it across the waist. Then they take a piglet, likewise cut in half, and so top of one to bottom of other. So they take a, a chicken and a pig and cut them in half and then sew them together, stick them together. This cockatrice tasted good, but the noble Earl would not eat it. Eat of it or any other dish before his butler had tasted it to see if it was fit for his master. So they're making sure it's not poisoned. I tire now and so shall write more upon the morrow, August 8th, Wednesday. I have told how grandly we ate at the feast, but in a few ways this banquet was like ordinary fare. As usual, of course, we ate with knife, spoon, and fingers and heaped our food upon tren trenchers of hard, stale cheap bread cut into thick slices. Drink, too, was much the same, but instead of the weak penny ale that is all we pages are normally allowed, the cupbearers poured us two penny ale, which tasted far stronger. As it grew later, the ale loosened everyone's tongues, and Humphrey and Oliver began to make fun, of, make rude fun of me. 
When I sat with my legs apart, Oliver did point to where they joined beneath my thin hose, which much glee he chanted, let not thy privy members be laid open to be viewed. Tis most shameful and abdo ab abhorred, detestable and rude. The tale of this rhyme I scarcely heard, for just then the miserable blew a f the minstrel, so the musician blew a fanfare. Both they and the tumblers had been entertaining us all most skillfully, though some of the minstrel song were, songs were saucy and made the ladies blush and bashfully study the floor. The horns that drowned Oliver's words announced a announced a sub subleaf. The subleaves were cunningly fashioned from sugar an almond paste and were one of the delicacies that ended each of the four courses. They were goodly sweet to taste, though they did not look like food at all. One was modeled as a hunting scene and another a mythical beast, but my favorite was the one that looked like a great ship tossed at sea. After the fanfare, I remembered no more, for this was when, or so I am told, I sickened and fell headlong to the floor. August 9th, Thursday. Because I am still weak and, did, and do not mend as quickly as my aunt would wish, my uncle has sent Simon to fetch a physician from Middlethorpe. This town is but an hour's ride from Stranborough, though my uncle said that as he doubts I am dying, Simon need not rush to return before tomorrow. So he's sick and the doctor's coming in to check on him. August 10th, Friday. The physician arrived today, Leech he is called, and the name describes him well, for he is round and sleek, and I like him not. Mm. First, he had me relieve myself into a glass flask so he could study my water. He held it up to the window to judge the color, and then brought it to his nose. I guess he would drink from it next, but instead he set it down at the table. Then he took from his purse a folded piece of parchment and opening it, studied its mysterious signs and marks with great care. He asked when the sickness began and for the day, hour, and place of my birth. From another chart, he worked out how stood the stars when I sickened, for this too affects his choice of cure. Then he announced, the boy is melancholic and earth fights fire for control of his body. This surprised me not a little, for I had thought it was the surfeit of food and ale I had swallowed at the banquet that allied my gut. Finally, he added that I should bleed, but as this was not a favorable time for such a task, he would return if needed in a few days. So uh, Tobias is sick and they're like, what was common practice to get one better was to, really bleed some of their blood out of them and we know that's not really it doesn't work august 12th the lord's day still i am confined to my bed in the great chamber when i tried to rise this morn the room swung so wildly about me that i felt sick to my stomach again and my aunt straight away made me lie back down today my aunt received a visitor this woman who is who is called lady cicely is my aunt's friend and lives in the neighboring manor of littlethorpe she brought with her a younger sister, Jane. Together, all four women whiled away the day, whiled away the day in working at their needlepoint and playing chess and backgammon. Mostly, though, they gossiped of the banquet and of the noble knights they knew. Later, Jane and Isabel tried to teach me backgammon, but my brain was too muddled to make much sense of it. When they went to eat in the hall, Mark sneaked in to see how I did, which cheered me greatly. So his friend's coming in to check on him, that's so nice. August 13th, Monday. Dr. Leach came again today, and after much peering and prodding, he declared once more that I must bleed to release the ill humors or fluids that are in my body. Grasping hold of my arms, he straightway chose a vein and opened it with a knife. He told my aunt that this would let out the black bile, of which I have too much, and that as the moon is nearly full, this is a good time for bleeding. At length, the leech, at length, the leech bandaged up my arm and, taking out a piece of parchment, wrote the letters of my name on it. Then he gave each of the letters a number, summed them all together, and announced, The boy shall live. Nice job, doctor. At this, my aunt nearly swooned with joy and paid the fat doctor well for all his work, but I feel sicker than ever, and my arm hurts abysmally. Oh. So the 
big banquet happened. So much is going on. Tobias got sick. And we will leave off there and we'll pick it up tomorrow, friends. I think we're going to finish the book uh, tomorrow next time we read. So be ready for that, okay? Have a good one.